All right, so let's go back a little bit. Yeah. So you go. So you're you're now saying to yourself, how do I do unit? How do I play unit structures yeah. on the guitar? Yeah. What's the methodology? Because everybody understands the methodology in trying to play bebop or trying to learn how to play over changes or yeah. transcription, and then you know trying to glean your own sound from your influences and various things like that. How did you in that stage go to say, okay, this is what I'm trying to. Th- this is how I'm going to approach the sort of practice of it or the methodology involved. Well, I listened to everything I could find and. Maybe being a mimic, you know, like I could tell jokes and, and imitate Groucho Marx and, you know, sure, yeah, W.C. Yeah. Fields and things like that back then, imitate everybody around me. I had good ears. Yeah. So, um, you know, I start to notice things that happen. And I can't say I could describe them then, um, but I also read everything anyone ever said about it. Um, uh-huh. I read what critics wrote about it. I read what Cecil Taylor said about it. I read what Jimmy Lyons and Andrew Cyril and... Uh, Everybody. I read what Anthony Braxton said about Cecil Taylor's music. I read everything. I, mm-hmm. I'm I like a hardcore scholar of this stuff in the in a very do-it-yourself way. I'm a big fan of it. You know, this is like what I do. So yeah. I just immersed myself in every little bit of information I could get. And I played along with the records. I mean, the reason I thought I could do anything was because I put records on and played along with them. Sure. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I don't think I could have played Giant Steps when I was uh, 18, but I could play along with One Down, One Up on New Thing at Newport because yeah. I put the record on and and played along with it mm-hmm. and listened to tried to copy what Coltrane did. Um, so, you know, I got so I could play along with the stuff, and then I started kind of figuring out what it was and reading what Cecil said and listening to... I, I think for me, the, the thing that really helped me to understand... Cecil and I use this example with all of my students when I talk to them about unit structures is listening to Jimmy Lyons play alto saxophone with him mm-hmm. because the ease this the clearest example of how melody is used and how that melody is improvised on or what I would say processed though how those melodic structures are are uh, expanded upon is is very very evident in Jimmy Lyons' playing. So mm-hmm. I mean, if you want to understand bebop, you listen to Charlie Parker. Sure. You could listen to some guy that you heard at the at the bar down the street play like Charlie Parker. But that's a that's like the last little drip in the in the in the farthest tributary off the smallest river. Right. If you sure. go to the big river, there's more information there. And yeah. So I, I I drew a lot on Jimmy Lyons and I tried to you know comprehend how he made a phrase and tried to play like him. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, but it's a, it's a fairly organic approach. It's the idea that you're going to sit down and just try it out over and over, trial and error, just try different things. And there was to... no other way to, to develop it. You, there was no, unless you went and studied with Cecil or took lessons from Jimmy, which I didn't even know was possible until 1984 when I met Jimmy and I met some people who did take lessons with him. I didn't know that was possible. Uh-huh. Um, there was no one who could tell you. There's, there was no there was no one to study that with. I mean, when I was thinking sure. about becoming a, gu- a guitar player, I already had this in mind in, you know, at 18 years old when I would have gone to a conservatory. There was no one. I, I wasn't going to walk in and go, hey, I'm really into trying to play the guitar like this and have sure. anybody do anything but laugh me out of the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's one of the reasons I suppose I... I try to be so completely welcoming and accommodating to every one of my students based on what they bring to me because it's an idea that's kind of that could be really important if you crush it it's over. I wasn't going to let anybody crush me. Part of my feral up, you know, self-raising kind of upbringing is that uh, you know, I don't take a lot of grief. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wasn't going to let anybody stop me just because they thought I was wrong. I would just walk away from it. So yeah. there wasn't any there wasn't any other way to do it except to do it you know, by ear, sure, and to and to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, even today, there's no. I find it interesting that in the world of, let's say, conventional modern jazz music, you have you have to be able to play bossa novas, bebop, modal music. There's a whole spectrum, you know, from early Ellington to you know contemporary whatever, mm-hmm. and yet let's say, like, The Shape of Jazz to Come came out in 1959, and still almost nobody can tell you what's going on. I was searching for that. And when, I was, when, I, when I was a kid, but into undergrad, I was like, I'd transcribe this stuff. I'd listen to it over and over again. But nobody could tell me what was happening. Yeah. You know, even now, I don't think there's a lot of schools that are, that are going into it or people who really... I mean, you're, you, 
you actually literally wrote the book on uh, the properties of free music. Well, but yeah, there's not a lot of people doing it to this day, you know. No, and it's and it's on them. It's on them for that. And you know that book's been out for eight years, almost eight years now. So, and it's not as if I mean it sells pretty well for a book like that. And there's a lot of people around the world who read it, and I hear from a lot of them. But mm. I don't see it being used regularly anywhere. It's used in colleges, and some people use it. Uh, Taylor Hope Bynum, who teaches at Dartmouth, uses it a lot. Mm -hmm. And and um, uh, but he's also somebody that really understands us. He's the one sure. other person I can think of in the world who could who could teach the stuff I teach because he knows it very well. And um, I mean, I, th I think that's a kind of a dis well. It's a disgrace, really, that that um, academia, and I'm not somebody who slams academia because I think it's amazing that people can learn how to play bebop. You know, they sure. did that. People figured that out. Yeah. But partly they could figure that out because it's based on harmony. Mm -hmm. And that's what I said in, in uh, Perpetual Frontier, The Properties of Free Music, my book, is that, you know, we're talking about stuff that is not based on harmony. Right. And so there's no Western rule to govern what this is. And so institutions follow these Western rules and they might say, well, we love, we love, you know, Duke Ellington and Miles Davis and Wayne Shorter. And they do, but really what they can understand about what they do is the stuff based on harmony because yeah. there's rules about that. And there's, sure. there's a lot, you know, endless an analysis and they have, it gives them a, a context to work in. I think the properties of free music defines the context to understand these other things. And without understand and it's not like I define what the artists I speak about uh did. They define that. Mm -hmm. But um that the Cecil Taylor's explanation of his music is is isn't taken seriously by academics. Uh Ornette Coleman's explanation of harmonics is not taken seriously by academics. Mm -hmm. They try to explain it, those things based on their limitations. They don't take these artists at their word. Sure. I take them at their word. Yeah. When Ornette says we we transpose our melodies through the clefs, that's what I that's you know the fact is if you do that, you sound like Ornette. If you don't do that, your music's going to be modal because it's going to have an implied root. Ornette is trying not to have an implied root. Yeah. So people will say, well, what Ornette means by that? No, what Ornette means by that is he transposes his, his mel melodies through the clefs. Yeah. So if you want to understand Ornette, take the man at his word. If you don't take the man at his word, there's a problem. Sure. And that's perpetuating a very deep systemic problem that exists in the arts and in institutions, in the critical establishment, and in business related to music. That it's fine if you do. I mean, this is every African American musician can tell you this. It's fine if you do. If you you're inside the lines, you do what what's inside the line. You step out of the lines. It might be okay, but you're going to have to somehow prove it in a way that you would never have to prove it if you're a white person who with, sure. with a you know with a doctorate from you know some music school or something. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to have to do that because the notion that that people who are outside of, you know, who are in our society are like the other, that they're going to determine what's going to happen in music is like an affront to people who want to control it. And, you know, part of that is that's the point. Right. That's yeah, the yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the point, right? You know, right. like, let's upend that because that's part of the system that allows everybody to be horrible to people. Like, let's upend that. You know, one of the things that, that, I got from listening to Coltrane and reading about Cecil and, you know, this is, this is what I learned. It's it, it, like when I'm 17, 18 years old, it wasn't just, I'm going to be a guitar player. I don't have a career goal. I'm a human being trying to contend with all the things going on in the world with the, the war in Vietnam. And I was up for the draft. Fortunately, I got a high number, so I didn't have to go to Vietnam, you know, the economy was in the toilet in the 70s. Mm -hmm. There's no future. You weren't going to get a job at a factory or for, with a corporation. Interest rates were 17%. You couldn't buy a house. It's like, you know, so we're dealing with the whole thing. The question is, what helps us to understand how to get over this? I found that in, in jazz music, a, a lot of the information was there. Pay respect 
to different people, change the way society functions so it doesn't restrict certain people, so it includes people. It's not a political thing. It's like a human thing. Sure. Like we treat each other respectfully. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just went on the idea that if I could do something that contributed to that kind of idea, maybe people, you know, in a tiny microscopic way, it might influence the possibility that people murdered each other less. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. That there was like sure. the world was slightly less worse. And I don't know that that kind of thing in particular exists in any other area of the arts except like the music that I, I, I was interested in. That That's a huge part of it. It's survival and it's like dignity and it's fairness and it's the end of oppression. All the things that wreck humanity. Like sure. let's get rid of those. So that's in that kind of music. And uh, I think it's sort of unfortunately not dealt with like that and that's why a lot of things get discounted. Like, you know, I have to think about it at the conservatory. People don't study jazz from 1935 much, okay. which is a shame. Like, yeah. you know, they might play it, but they don't get they don't get into the details of it. They can go, oh, yes, uh, you know, 1939, Body and Soul, great tune. You know, Coleman Hawkins, that's a great tune, and we play like that. Yeah. But they're willing to go from 1935 to 1965, and as long as it makes sense in terms of harmony up to 1970 and beyond, 1958, 1959 to now, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> not so much. Right. They, they won't deal with this whole area of music. So, I mean, in some ways, that's I could complain about that, and I could rail against it, which I kind of don't. But in the way I operate, I just make my statements about it. Um Sure. But in you know, in an odd way, <laughs> knowing those things and caring about it is how I make a living. Yeah. You know. Sure. 